Hello guys, in the last few videos we updated our version 4 control board with a new clock and some extra pins. We generated our production files, our Gerber files, and we sent them off to PCBWay to get professionally manufactured and assembled. The assembled PCBs have now arrived, so what better way to test it than to take one of our vehicles that's already wired for a version 4 control board and test the new board in it. Well we've the Massey in the shed now, so let's see what we're working with. As you can see, the PCBs have come well packaged. We have plenty of bubble wrap and our panelised PCBs are all in anti-static bags. Here we have one of our PCB panels. So our four individual PCBs have just been arranged on this panel so that it can go through Maybe the pick and place machine or the the oven that uh, melts the solder paste. If they didn't panelise the PCBs like this, it'd be very difficult for them to be moved through an automated machine because our PCBs would have been extremely small. So by adding the rails down the side, it means that a, a consistent size of PCB can go through the machine and that just makes it easier to get the best results every time and from first glance it looks like everything has gone exactly the way we wanted it to our components are seated well there's no solder across in any of the pins on the atmega chip no solder has made its way into any of the header pins so everything looks pretty perfect here I don't think there's uh, anything on this board that we could really complain about I think the manufacturer has gone perfectly so we've made a few changes to the board. The first one is with our oscillator. So we went from a crystal type oscillator to an SMD IC sort of oscillator. So that's something different. We need to test that we're getting a signal out of that because the external crystal functionality had gone from the uh, at make a 3 to 8 PB chip so we really need to be using an oscillator like this another big difference between this PCB and the old one is that we now have the row of jumpers just below the the oscillator there so what that means we can do now is just slice the, the thin uh, trace of copper that you can see there we just slice that and that separates that uh, jumper or alternatively if we want to rejoin it we just put a solder blob across it but that means that we can uh, change the configuration based on the chip so at the minute with that little jumper there connected it suits the uh, atmega 328p because you need the ground and the vcc signal to the chip on those two pins but if we cut that when we're using an atmega 328pb then we can use the two extra pins if we need them most cases you probably won't need that many pins but it's good to have the options to get the pcbs out of the panel i'm just going to use uh, my snips here just to sort of lever against the the drill holes that are through the, the pcb and they snap off easily enough this is uh, another reason why picking the uh, the thicker pcb uh, was a sort of a better option for us if, you, if you'd picked a really small pcb like 0.8 millimeter just trying to do this you'd probably have uh, well, broken some of the solder joints but at 1.6 mil the PCB is pretty resilient the next thing we need to do is solder on the header so I'm just going to use one of the daughter boards to uh, line up the header so that we we know it's going to be in the right place and that the uh, module will plug in and plug out quite easily then and now that we have the header kind of stable in our PCB we'll just start soldering in the header pins so i usually would solder the four corners first and then go back to solder the ones in the middle that way it, you're less likely to end up with the header kind of going up the hill or something like that it's generally going to stay fairly flat if you do it that way i'm going to do the rest of the soldering off camera because uh, i pretty much can't see what i'm doing here i'm about two foot away from the pcb behind the camera so not easy to solder here's our uh, finished board and we're hooked up with the lipo battery we have the oscilloscope hooked up to a ground signal there with the blue wire our pcb is hooked up with the multicolored wire uh, there's two wires there that aren't connected to anything they're just in the board for keep them stable and then we're going to probe on our new test pad pins which we didn't have before the one at the top here is the one for the clock signal so that's the one we're most interested in 
and if we flick over to our signal we can see that our frequency there is 16 megahertz which is exactly what we were looking for another new feature we added was the change in the voltage regulator so if you look at the blue signal there I started off at 5 volts and we're now dropping the voltage but you can see our output is still stable 3.3 volts or very close to it and now we're into the range of our lipo battery now around 3.6 would be pretty discharged from a lipo battery but yet we still have the 3.29 volts coming out of our regulator so it's pretty good only when we fall below 3.3 volts are we starting to see our regulator drop but there's nearly no difference between uh, the two signals at 3 volts the lipo would be completely dead it would be you'd be damaging the lipo if you were letting it go down that far we can do a, a similar test only looking at the clock signal this time so we started around about 4.8 volts with the blue signal we're going down our yellow signal will be our be our clock signal and you can see it's generally around about 16 megahertz it's jumping around a bit because uh, i don't really have the right probes for this um, if you're doing this in a lab i think you'd use some sort of a differential probe but i just have the, the standard sort of probes but we're getting an idea of what's happening and as the voltage is dropping there the blue line we're down at 3.7 volts here but yet our clock is still roughly at the 16 megahertz so i think it's safe to say that both those changes are working uh, fairly successfully and the both working very well in the range of a one cell lipo battery well everything's working good so far so the next thing we need to do is get the nrf module soldered on and check that we're getting a good uh, radio signal from this so this is gonna take another bit of uh, acrobatic sort of soldering so I'll, I'll probably do one or two pins here and then uh, do it off camera again this board is basically the identical footprint to the uh, last version so all the programming boards and the motor driver boards are all going to be the same so i don't need to do anything special there i'll be able to just plug this straight into uh, the Arduino programming board and then it'll be the same with the vehicle I'll probably use the uh, Massey 8680 just as a test bed because I have it on the shelf here behind me and I think it's the uh, motor driver board for this particular uh, version the version 4 motor driver board so I have my Arduino Uno here I have the Arduino ISP sketch uploaded to it I'm using my programmer shield and now I'm just going to plug in the version 4.2 controller and we're ready to upload the program. Well, I don't think I have code for the Massey, so I'm just going to use this Scania code. And all we need to do is change the ID to 5 just to match the controller. And if we take a look down here, you can see that we're using the 4.2 library. We changed that pin from, eight, or from 9 to 8 when we uh, rearranged the board in the last videos. And... Uh, we have a couple of other pins we swapped the seven and the three i think as well so they're already switched there so we need to go to tools and we have selected the at mega three to eight but we need to use the mini core sort of add-on that gives you all the options here so we can choose the clock frequency external 16 megahertz we can disable the burnout detect choose the three to eight pb and we want to uh, then select our programmer as the arduino as isp because that's what we're doing and if you want to set up an arduino you plug your uno in and you use this example sketch the arduino isp example sketch so when you've all that done the first thing we need to do is burn our bootloader to our chip so that sets all these settings on the chip and it doesn't take all that long to do that it's only a small program the next thing is we're going to upload our sketch using the programmer because we already have it plugged in so that's the easiest way to get it uploaded to the, to the board and the reason i can use the scania uh, code here is because i'm pretty sure i've wired it exactly the same as i wired the massey so both of these should be pretty much the same but i need to change the servo limits so once i set the servo limits for the steering servo and lifting arm servo then the Massey should just work well assuming that everything else is wired properly now that we have the boards all programmed it's just a matter of installing it in the tractor 
so this one already has the motor driver board wired up so we just have to push the 4.2 control board into the motor driver and that should be it I could do it packing those wires in a little bit better it's just tricky to get them all in under the bonnet but everything is in so now let's uh, give it a little bit of power and you can see that the uh, controller is receiving a signal now and we have control there's steering drive control of the rear link although it looks like the limits maybe need to be adjusted and then we have our lights so our tail lights coming on we've no dipped lights because the, uh, the pin that we've signed doesn't have pwm function so we can't do the 50% duty cycle on that so it's just full on and we had our work lights there uh, this is the indicators now we're taking a look at so there's your right indicator and this will be our hazards I hit the two buttons yeah there's the hazards and uh, the beacons flashing away there on the top all the time and that's it our professionally manufactured PCBs are working exactly as we'd expect so I'll just say thanks again to PCBWay who supplied us with the sample PCBs and hopefully any of you viewers who are thinking of designing your own PCBs will see that it's not that uh, scary of an undertaking to try and get your own PCB professionally manufactured. You hopefully have an idea now of the kind of costs that you might expect and what the process kind of looks like. So if you like the videos don't forget to hit the thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe and get the bell on and all of that stuff. And as always, thanks very much for watching.